أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين I begin in Allah's name, the beneficent, the merciful. And Allah tells us in the Holy Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, the second chapter of the Quran, the second verse. As you know, it starts with Huruf al muqattaat Alif Lam Meem, Thalik Al-Kitab, La Rayba Fee Hudan Lil Muttaqeen, Alladheena Yu'minuna Bil Ghayb, Wa Yuqeemuna Salata Wa Mimma Razaqnaahum Yunfiqoon, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ وَمَا أُنزِلَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ وَبِالْآخِرَةِ هُمْ يُوقِنُونَ صلى الله عليه وسلم محمد وآل محمد In these verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the second chapter of the Quran Surah Al-Baqarah the longest chapter in the Quran where Allah says ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابِ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهُ هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ in this book, there is no doubt for those who are God conscious. La riba fi. There is no doubt for those who are of the God conscious. And as we listen to these lectures, our objective should be to achieve certainty. Wa'bud rabbaka hatta ya'tikal yaqeen. Keep serving your Lord until you achieve certainty. Yaqeen. For there is nothing more pleasurable to us all than certainty. When you and I have certainty with issues, we know what to do with it. Even if it means death, certainty, meeting something with certainty, including death, you will find yourself to be in a very tranquil state. You will find yourself in a state of tranquility. In English, they call it ataraxia. You will be in a tranquil state and you will find yourself able to manage the rights and the wrongs because we have certainty. What causes us to have confusion, as I mentioned before, where people who indulge in drugs, who indulge in alcohol, who indulge in gambling, it's all because they lack certainty. When they lack certainty, then they become very erratic in behavior. Human nature is that we are very confident when we have certainty. And we love people who have certainty. We admire confident people. Even if they are wrong, but if they exude a confident state of mind, we tend to feel more comfortable with them. So if you're in the jungle and you're lost, and there's somebody in the group acting confident, simply acting confident, you will find that that person will be more of a consolation than anybody else. Because we as a human race, are constantly looking for confidence and certainty. So Allah says, La Reba fi. There is no doubt in this book. But for who? Hudan lil muttaqin. Who are they? Alladina yu'minuna bil ghayb. They are the ones who believe in the unseen. Now this is a conversation in and of itself. For the unseen reality is the most powerful exam Allah is giving us with reference to the trials and tribulations we have in life. And for us to achieve certainty of the unseen requires reflection, meditation, and using the faculties Allah has given us. That God gave us eyes and ears, you see, and a mind and tongue. Allah says, فَجَعَلْنَاهُ سَمِيعًا بَصِيرًا Allah created mankind from a clot and then He endowed this being, you see. He gave them سَمِيعًا بَصِيرًا because it is through hearing and sight that you will be able to be examined. And here سَمِيعًا بَصِيرًا doesn't only mean سَمِيعًا, you know, سَمِيعًا بَصِيرًا It doesn't only mean that. It actually means that if you don't have eyes, or you don't have hearing, 
then your other faculties will become more enhanced. So the ability to hear with touch, the ability to sense with touch are all within the parameters of this verse. Samian basira. Inna hadaynahu sabira. Indeed, we guided mankind towards the right path, meaning our inner conscience, our fitra, already knows that it is not good to lie. We already know that. Atheists will argue on the same basis, that they all know universally, every human being on earth, eight billion plus on earth today, will unanimously agree that it is not good to lie. And it is good to speak the truth. It is good to be honest. It is good to be humble. It is good to be wise and intelligent. It is not good to be ignorant and arrogant. This is a universal message of God. That when Allah says, وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا And by the self which He perfected, He taught this self what is wrong and what is right. Why is that? Because it's an essential piece of the equation. For if you and I lack that ability, then Allah cannot hold us liable on Judgment Day. In fact, the Qur'an is very succinctly clear on this matter that without being guided, Allah cannot punish anyone. Allah ensures that prophets and imams and scriptures are sent unto mankind to guide them morally, for if He did not, then we are absolved of any misbehaviors that we may perform on this earth. This is very powerful and very important to understand. But there are those people who actually imagine the possibility of a non-existent being who is God. Meaning this earth has no God. And then there are Muslims that I've met, and I'm talking specifically within the Muslim faith. Of course the non-Muslim faith is a different conversation. But within Muslims, we find that there are those who believe that Allah created this universe and then left us alone to manage our own affairs. Sort of in a deistic way where God created things, the universe, then He left us alone. He doesn't interfere in our affairs. And the reason the deists go in that direction is in order to validate the existence of evil. For they can't understand how God who manages it can allow evil to exist. So one of the possibilities they bring forth is to say that God um, is not involved. Then there's another branch of philosophy called process theology where they believe that when God created, He had good intentions, but He wasn't aware of the outcome. And one of the outcomes was evil, and He couldn't control it, so that's why evil exists. It's what we call collateral outcome. Hmm. An almighty God who creates and doesn't know. An omnipotent, absolute being who creates and doesn't know. These are all conjectural arguments that don't make sense. But there are people who actually try to go in that direction. And look, I respect all of them because in my opinion even atheists when they argue that there is no God I respect them they're wrong but I respect them at least they're trying to make an effort to understand at least they're challenging the establishments and trying to purify themselves they're wrong in their conjectural arguments but I have to give them credit for the fact that at least they're trying to attempt and when I listen to philosophers try to give all kinds of explanation as to how the universe works I carefully listen to all of them because it enables me to certify my faith. It enables me to understand the veracity and the validity of my own faith. For then I'm able to compare it. You see, the Prophet said, Udlu bil ilm min al mahd il al lahd. Acquire knowledge from the cradle to the grave. How do you acquire knowledge? By these conversations. Right? Talib al ilm, faridatun ala kulli muslim. bis seen the Prophet. Even if you have to go to China, you must go and gain knowledge. Even from disbelievers, you must gain it. So you and I have to make every attempt, every second of our lives on this earth, reflective, cogitating, meditating, as we say, constantly working towards improving ourselves and status to achieve certainty. Wa'bud rabbaka hatta ya'tikan yaqeen. Maintain this worship. And the way we will maintain it is by understanding the grand scheme of things and then the sub-things of things. And then you and I will understand who we are within this spectacular universe. And then we will be able to push the right buttons, inshallah. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ahli Muhammad. So let me summarize. In the last five, this is my fifth lecture, I think. You find that 
First and foremost, Allah created us purely out of His mercy. And I'm summarizing here so you understand. And I want you clearly to understand that when we go to Karbala, and we're going to talk about these phenomenal heroes who, from children all the way to old age, when they gave their souls for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it wasn't an exercise in futility, it wasn't madness, it wasn't some kind of rage. It was calculated with certainty. It was the kind that brought about an individual that there are two kinds of jihad. Jihad al-Asghar and Akbar. The one in Karbala was Asghar. Please understand that. Akbar was the self. And when you are able to manipulate yourself, Qū anfusakum, Sheikh mentioned before, Ya yawladhina amanu, Qū anfusakum wa ahlikum nar. All you who believe, save yourselves and your family from that impending fire, which is going to be a punishment. What is the fire? Allah doesn't like to put anybody in hell. And Allah did not create hell by design to put us in hell. Allah by design has designed all of us for paradise. But it is our foolishness in rejecting good and our willful desire to go against the goodness of God that God says, well, in that case then, you really want hell, so I'll give it to you. That's why I give you hell. God did not create humanity to put majority of them burning in hell and there's a small minority entering paradise. This concept is false. It's a false concept. Don't believe in it, please. We humans have a choice. Do we want to enter paradise or do we want to enter hell? I can guarantee if I scope the earth and ask the majority of the human beings, 99.9% .9 they will tell you we want to go to paradise. So guess what? They do. But we are victims of history. We are victims of misinformation and disinformation. We are victims of society. We are victims of culture. We are victims of ignorance. And as a result we perpetuate ignorance because we feel that it's socially acceptable to be ignorant. For when we become wise and we become erudites in society, that somehow the world will not like us. What a foolish thought. For there is nothing more beautiful you and I possess, as the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stated, Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He said the most beautiful possession a human being has is their intellect. When a person speaks intelligently, they become beautiful. It doesn't matter how they look anymore. We fall in love with them. It doesn't matter physically. It's the essence of the person's inner qualities when they exude outwardly in a beautiful manner, in a logical, systematic, in a modest manner, where an individual has their tongue fi mashik, min sawtik, inna ankar al aswat, la sawtul hamir. See, Luqman is saying to his son, be modest. See? Waqsid fi mashik. And lower your voice. What would mean salting? Don't be loud. Don't speak loud. When you speak loud, Allah says you sound like a donkey. Inna ankar al aswad la saltul hamir. Meaning, when you are loud and boisterous, and we say belligerent or pugnacious in nature, where you're constantly trying to get into a brawl and fight with people. But then, you know, the human race looks at you as an anathema. You know what's an anathema? Like a curse, like a, like a problem, like a sickness. You're like a cancer in society. But when you're gentle, when you're kind, and you're, you have a very pleasant demeanor, and your smile is magnetic, and it's attractive, that's a true believer. Now imagine if you're intelligent with that, and you probe deep into knowledge, where you're able to decipher what is being spoken and you pick the best out of it and you bring the jewels forward and you say, this is what I've understood and you've got one cl step closer to Allah which means one step closer to certainty such people are the greatest blessings on earth. Tonight in these lectures we pray to Allah that my Lord increase my certainty. My Lord, increase my ability to see through this. Give me this ability to cut through knowledge the way you gave Imam Muhammad Baqar salam. Although all Imams have that title and all Prophets have that title, but Imam Muhammad Baqar is known as Baqir al uloom You know what Baqir means? One who splits knowledge. One who takes knowledge, splits it, and shows you the nuances of knowledge. That's the gift you and I must have. 
And that doesn't come for free. It requires a tremendous amount of meditation, reflection, you see, constant movement to all the time understand. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful that He has endowed us with all of this. So let me summarize briefly what is our objective in life. First, Allah created us purely out of His mercy. Quick summary, purely out of His mercy. Which means that He didn't have to, nor does He need our worship. Please understand that. When we hear the hadith that Allah willed to be recognized, that will is not a need. It is a want. There's a difference. A want means you want to show your mercy. It's like you're extremely wealthy, you're independent, but you want to help the needy. You don't have to, but you want to. That's a very merciful act. You and I are its recipients. Please understand that. You and I were created humans. We could have been created other kinds of creatures. God said, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّبْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ We have honored you. And Quran is replete with verses about how mankind has been honored. You are a human being. You've been destined for paradise. You were created for a higher station of existence. And you are a magnificent human being. And that when you do speak intelligently, you will look magnificent. I always give this example. If you see somebody who is extremely physically, outwardly magnificent to look at, and your eyes cannot take, you know, you cannot take your eyes off that person, but then they start talking, and they're empty-headed, silly talk, very dumb. You're like, ah, oh, who's this? Suddenly the person no longer looks good. Outwardly they're magnificent, but there's a disconnection. This is a magnificent person, but they don't know how to talk. They've got a vile tongue, their logic is skewed, they're very, very shallow, very, quite ignorant. As they say, empty barrels make the most noise, right? So you find you look at this person and say, oh, well, what is it? The person has the endowment, the eyes are beautiful, the hair is beautiful, nothing has changed, their height hasn't changed. Suddenly, you're no longer as attracted. Exactly, because it is our intellect that is the most beautiful. So you and I, while we are polishing our outer bodies, and working out and making good, you know, our body and making sure our skin is supple and healthy looking and taking care of our hairs and so on, which we should, which we should. But remember, nothing is more important than the inner soul and the conscience and the intelligence. That is central to all successes. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. You know what's amazing about God's blessing upon us is when I come up here and I speak and I start a subject I feel like there is an ocean in front of me to talk about but then there are ten other pathways to go so which one do you go I said oh my god I'm swimming in this ocean of of God's mercy and where do I go what do I say there is so much for me to say not because I'm wise it's because God has been so merciful in drenching us with so much mercy all we have to do is open our eyes and touch it and apply it and we become its beneficiaries. So first Allah created us out of his mercy and when he created us out of his mercy, this is a whole conversation, maybe one of these nights I'll talk about it. Tonight my main subject is about long-term vision. This is one of the criteria for you and I to achieve certainty. It requires long-term vision. I'm going to touch on this briefly tonight given the time that I have. But please bear in mind, nothing, one of the most important characteristics you and I will have to achieve certainty is long-term vision. And when you and I have long-term vision, and when we do have certainty, we will automatically exercise patience. When Allah says, Inna Allah, Ya ayuhal ladhina amunu sta'inu bis sabri wa salat, Inna Allah ma'as sabirin, all those of you believe, and join upon each other. Ya ayu ladhin amun sta'inu. Sabri wa salah. Patience in prayer. Right? Indeed, God is with the patient ones. Inna Allah ma'as sabirin. Please understand this. This is very profound. For the sabirin to be with Allah is very different than for Allah to be with the sabirin. We who are his slaves, to be with Allah is a great honor. But for Allah to be with the patient ones is beyond description honor. It's the kind of honor that cannot be fathomed nor measured. 
How do you and I get the sabr? The sabr of Imam Hussain alayhi salam, the sabr of Ahlul Bayt, the sabr of Amir al Mu'mineen, the sabr of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How do we get that? Long term vision. And that vision is so clear that you and I are holding tomorrow in our hands today. So Quran says, Alladina yu'minuna bil ghayb. The ones who have taqwa are the ones who believe in the unseen. And believing in the unseen requires a lot of reflection and meditation and planning and looking at the current situation and examining the past and now you prognosticate the future. It means that I am now going to dictate my movement based on the past and present. I already have enough parameters to be able to understand the outcomes of tomorrow. And Allah is merciful that He guarantees that system. That when you and I understand the past and the present, that the future is guaranteed based on how you and I submit to the present and understand the past. So many a times, if we don't measure what is the world really today, and we are whimsical and knee-jerk reacted, where our friends and the fad societies are flashing some red light somewhere and everybody's running in that direction and then the red light comes on the eastern side and we're all running there. We're like a bunch of blind creatures going from one side to the other because everybody's doing that. That's the coolest thing to do. We're, we're living in a very fad society today. We're driven by fads. Who's gathering where? Oh, there's this club. That 10,000 people. It really was, it's all dark and dingy and it's noisy and smoky. Wow, amazing. Let's go. The angels are laughing at us. Look at these foolish creatures. They want to go to a place they can't see each other, they can't talk to each other, they can't hear each other. And it's smoky. Those are clubs. These are how clubs are. Silly, but everybody's there. Do you ever notice, by the way, in our societies, when, everybody, when people start to do something even that's not halal, if everybody's doing it, a lot of people are doing it, it starts to become mustahab. It's amazing. Haram becomes mustahab. Everybody's doing it. I say to kids, you smoke weed? Yeah, brother. Why? Hajj. Everybody's doing it. I said, yeah, you're right. We should change that. We should make it mustahab. And then if we all do it religiously, it should become wajib, right? Hmm? You notice that everybody does it? So just because everybody does something wrong, you live in a society where you come in Europe, for example, in England, every other block, there's a pub. Go to Manhattan, New York City, 445, 455, the bars are packing. Every bar on the street is full. What did you do? Oh, we're all gonna go get, you know, drunk. Why? Well, we're busy. Busy doing what? Making money. For what? So we can live nicely. To do what? So we can retire. How? To destroy your brain cells? So you end up in a hospital? You know, in my university, Thursday night, the music starts to pound. The whole building is rocking. Boom, 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 boom. Like I was getting a headache. And then kegs of beers get rolled. Kegs. Forget about bottles. Kegs. 50,000 gallons per weekend. My God, I'm watching this. I can't believe this. When Allah says, Khamru al Rizzun, this is filthy. This stuff is ugly. Human nature has no direction, no long term vision. We're impulsive, Pavlovian, and everybody is doing it. And Miller and Budweiser is financing it all, and we just have to go out there and get drunk. And then come Sunday morning, they've got a massive headache, you know, hangover. They're like sipping coffee, and I'm looking at them like, what's next? Library. <laughs> really? What? You've got to start studying. I said, Thursday you destroy the brain cells, and then Monday you start feeding it again. What a cyclical madness. And we've got presidents today in our countries who are like that, who are misogynistic, womanizers, what we call philanderers, unethical, mendacious, pathological liars. And we have produced them as leaders of the world today. What a comparison of that to what we're going to converse tonight in Karbala. My God. Hmm? Can you compare this to? Even when alcoholics, I meet them and I say to them, do you like what you're doing? Well, what else do I have? 
I said, well, why don't you stop? I love to, but how am I going to stop? I, or they'll say, there's nothing wrong. I'm not an alcoholic. He can't even stand straight. I'm not an alcoholic. It's called denial. In psychology, you call it denial. I don't have a problem. Me? I'm not sick. <laughs> I'm not an addict. The guy's got needles hanging out. I'm not an addict. Yeah, because psychology says validate by invalidations. Insist it's not there. Just turn a blind eye. When Allah is saying, I endowed you with intellect, intelligence, incredible powers, and what do you do? You blast it for no reason? Why do people do this? Even my professors, who I respected during the day, I would see them to get drunk at night. The next day, I just cannot respect them anymore. I said, with all due respect, you're smart in what you do, but you cannot be a role model for me. For your unethical stance in public is clearly, clearly something that is abhorrent in my vision when it comes to somebody at the moral level who simply cannot be my role model. And one rule about morality, by the way, just as a quick footnote, morality cannot be played with. Material things can be played with. For example, if somebody comes to you in your life at an early age or in middle age and lies to you and they cheat you willfully, willfully, you knew they planned this, they cheated you, you caught them, they asked for forgiveness. Will you ever see that person with respect again? Even 100 years they're honest, you'll always be doubting with that one. When we talk about infallibility of prophets and imams and people shrug their shoulders like, how, how can prophets be infallible? They're human. I said, brothers and sisters, please understand. Prophets and imams came to teach us morals. The foundation of moral demands a pure pathway. It's like a pipe where dirty water is going to run through, right? Imagine if the, I mean, pure water is going to run through. Pure water is going to run through this dirty pipe. You're going to get what? Dirty water. When Allah sends them as a conduit to send us the messages, if prophets make one mistake, one error, the entire religious system of morality is questionable. Their integrity is pivotal and critical. You and I, as common people, if we cheat each other once, it still lingers in our heads. That is why ghiba, accusing somebody, tuhmat, is so ugly. Allah says, when you do ghiba, meaning when you backbite someone, it is like you've eaten the flesh of your dead brother. أَيُحِبُّ أَحَدُكُمْ أَنْ يَأْكُلَ اللَّحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتًا Allah says it's detestable, isn't it? Well, that's what you do because when you mar somebody's character, the person who heard it now has a reason to doubt your veracity of your character. This is why people suffer with backbiting and gossiping. And it's the worst thing you and I can do. So good believers who have certainty, who have long-term vision, who practice patience, immediately understand such things can never be done because in the outcome of the future, long-term vision, this is deadly. Our Prophet has said, Imam Ali has said, whenever you plan to do an act, always think about its consequences before you do it. For if you are unaware of its consequences, you may not be able to collect, to take it back. It's like public speaking, it's like speaking. Imam Ali alayhi salam in Najul Balagha says, every word you utter before it leaves your mouth, it is your property. Once you've spoken, it is public and you can never take it back. You will be accused of it, by it, and it will no longer be in your jurisdiction. You will become a victim of it, so be very careful what you say. So a wise man thinks before they speak, a foolish person speaks and then thinks. That is why it is so important for us to have long-term vision. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. I'm going to move very quickly. My apologies if I'm going into a few tangents, but I think it's very important for us to understand. And you know, when I speak about these examples of alcohol, drinking, debauchery, womanizing, and so on. These are the ills of society. And we live in a society today that normalizes this. Where having a six pack of beer in your, in your refrigerator or dating indiscriminately, freely, having different kinds of mates is commonly accepted in society. Whereas the moral fabric within Islam 
that promotes modesty, hence this hijab that is so essential in Islam. There are people who argue there is nowhere in the Quran about hijab. I look at them and say, which, which book are you reading? Like, there is nowhere in the Quran. So, which Quran are you reading? Okay, hijab is clearly mentioned in the Quran. There's no question about it. There are five schools of thought. We have differences about leadership, but we have no differences about modesty. There must be something here. It's extremely powerful. But modesty is the religion of Islam. And Islam is a religion of modesty. You find Zainab salam, the sister of Imam Hussain salam, who was this indomitable figure in Karbala, who spoke against Yazid and said, Ya Yabna Tulaqa. Why was she there? She was there to say, I am the flag bearer of modesty. I am the flag bearer of decency. We are the mothers of generations. And what we produce are pure children, not adulterated children in today's societies. Illegitimacy, adultery is common. We've got a president who has put his hands in so many bad places and he continues to be the president. And society is shrugging. It's okay, it's just the president. As long as the economy is good, we don't care. This is the problem in society, that if our children are gonna grow up in the modern society where leaders are absolved of their immodesties and indecencies and immoralities, what are we sending as a message to our next generation? That son, daughter, it's okay. As long as you become a leader, become a billionaire, have your own airline, have your own jet, and as long as you're rich and powerful, even if you're a misogynist, a philanderer, messing around with all kinds and producing illegitimate children and raping women, it's okay because just keep the economy good. Is that what life is about? Allah says, Al-Mal wal Banun, Zinatul Hayat al Dunya, Wal Baqiyatu Salihat, Khairun Inda Rabbika Thawaba, Khairun Amala. The best thing, what is left are your good deeds. Deeds are moral, modest. When you and I examine living in this part of the world, yesterday a young brother came to me and asked me a beautiful question, really put a smile on my face. He said, brother, how do we know Islam is the right religion? We've got Christianity, Judaism, all these other religions. How do you know Islam is right? And how do you feel so certain that God exists? I looked at him, I said, beautiful question. Thank you for asking. We'll talk more about this. I said, but I want you to look around and question the integrity of this great religion, Islam. And I said, there are religions that believe God has a son who died on a cross, who complained on the cross for the sin of somebody else's sin. Hmm. You know, you commit a sin and somebody else gets killed. How? By what logic? When God is so merciful and he's so just. I asked my Christian brethren, if Adam made the mistake, simple, God is very loving and very forgiving. Forgive him. We all have to go to hell for that? What kind of logic is this? Well, that's the design. So who, who cooked this design? It's certainly not from God. But there are two billion plus people who actually believe in this. They are victims. When you look at our Christian brethren, they are good people, God loving. Their spirit is no different than ours, but they've been misinformed. So this logic of expression to clearly understand at the base level to say nobody in the world has the purity of the oneness of God but Islam. And Allah says in the in the Allah Islam, the religion to Allah is Al-Islam, which is what? Oneness of God. When you look at the Quran cover to cover, it's all about Tawheed. If you examine it, it's persistent, consistent. And it maintains a constancy of messaging that God is the Almighty and His Messenger is the conduit by which mankind is to be performing. And be conscious of your moral duty, for once you scratch it or you, in other words, once you harm it, you will be marginalized. So if you have a friend who lied to you, it's very difficult. Notice, the more you lie and the more you forgive, let's say I lied, I said I'm sorry. People say, okay, no problem, we're forgiving. Now, we don't condemn such people, by the way. There is no such thing as saying, well, you lied 20 years ago, so I'll always condemn you. No. You forgive mankind. We forgive. When people do bad things, alcohol, drinking, lying, debauchery, whatever, even cheating, even armed robbery, and they're asking for forgiveness, forgive them. Forgive them. God loves those who seek forgiveness. Wallahu Wallahu Rahim. 
لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم He forgives you all if you seek redemption But the quality of an individual is degraded for each mishap So you will notice that morality has one direction So maintain it from birth Try to maintain purity at birth. The world should not remember you as an evildoer yesterday. For maybe you become a good person, and you can, but it will always linger. Try your best to always be on the good path. Don't say, let me try haram, let me be really bad, I'll do alcohol, I'll do drugs, I'll do bad things. Tomorrow I'll ask for repentance, then I'll be okay. Morality doesn't work that way. So don't go there first. But notice with material, it's different. Let's say you're a billionaire. You walk into a mosque or you go into business, everybody's kissing your hand. It's the rich guy. You see his cars? MashaAllah, it's very rich. Oh, where is he? I want to meet him. It's very important. Why? Because of his money. Hmm. Then this poor guy, this rich guy becomes poor. He's got no money. Can't even afford a car now. Everything was taken. Nobody wants to look at him. <laughs> poor guy, who cares about him? Society is like that, huh? Ayyub, you know, as a prophet, was wealthy. When he became poor and Allah took his wealth away and made him ill, most of his friends loved him. Who wants such friends? You want friends like that? If I, if I have friends knowing that because I'm wealthy and because I'm powerful that they love me, I don't want such friends. I want friends that I could be a pauper in the desert with tattered clothes and my friend is standing next to me trying to help me. That's a real friend, not a friend who wants my money. But now let's say that person becomes rich again. Everybody goes back to the person. Oh, you're, you're rich again? That's even better. Wow, you became poor and you became rich. I love you even more. You must be amazing. You must know how to really make money. So notice, money and material things, you lose, you gain, you lose, you gain. It doesn't affect you. But morals, you lose. It stays with you forever. So please understand that if people cheat us or lie to us, or they harm us, it's very difficult to let go. So logic and wisdom dictates, don't go there. But how can you not go there? Allah says, ittaqillah, be God conscious, be aware. How, oh Allah, how do I prevent myself from going astray? Long-term vision. Understand, you didn't come on this earth whimsically. You were not born on this earth accidentally. And there is a being who monitors everything you do, as I mentioned yesterday, that the moral argument demands an all-seeing being. And there is nothing more beautiful than going into a courthouse and somebody has accused you, but the judge knows everything. You don't have to bring any evidence. Your existence is evidence for or against you. Who would love to go to such a court? Only honest people, only good people. Evil people will hate to be in such a judgment, won't they? Because they know they'll be exposed. Allah says, I am the ultimate. I am the one who will tell you what you did on judgment day. And there is not an iota that will be hidden. Just think that way. Think that way. Every single day that when you see injustice is taking place and you see tyrants killing people and you see all kinds of wickedness in the world, say, Alhamdulillah, there is a God who sees. Alhamdulillah, he will expose it. This was the conversation of Imam Hussein in Karbala. Consistently saying to them, it's okay, you're practicing amnesia right now after writing me letters to come to Kufa and now you're pretending you know nothing because Ibn Ziyad has put fear into you? Do a problem. God sees everything and you will be exposed tomorrow, day after tomorrow, forever. The choice is yours. Why? Well, Imam is challenging them. You lack long-term vision. You are so short-term vision, that's why you've gotten lost. And with all due respect, summary, believers in God have the longest vision. Atheists have the shortest vision. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So in summary, Allah blessed us, intellect, He's given us free will. If there is one gift Allah has given us, it's free will. It's a whole conversation, introduction today, free will. How is free will working? You might think, what is free will? Do we really have free will? Or did God actually, is, is God controlling everything? Some of us think that Allah is controlling everything and it is by destiny. And you know that the Bani Umayyah, they used it very in a crafty way. Muawiyah and Yazid and Ibn Ziyad, 
You know when Imam Zain al-Abideen was brought after Karbala, Ibn Ziyad was pontificating on the pulpit, the governor's pulpit, and he looks at this young, handsome young man standing. He says, who are you? He says, my name is Ali. Look what Ibn Ziyad says after Karbala. He said, didn't God kill Ali? In Karbala, didn't God already kill Ali? Look how he says it. He doesn't say he killed. Didn't God already kill? Look at how wicked he is. He says, didn't God already kill? Imam Zain al-Abidin says, God didn't kill, you did. He says, oh, you're very intelligent. Why are you still alive? Kill him. Zainab salam jumps towards him and says, if you're going to kill him, then kill me. And all the people in Kufa said, shame on you, Ibn Ziyad, if you're going to kill a woman. This is how intrepid Zainab was. She said, if you're going to touch him, you're going to have to kill me. That's how strong as a woman she was. But look at the wisdom. But look at the debauchery of the other side in trying to mismanage religion to confuse us under the premise of predestination. Such that they say, Hasin bin Namir, he's burning the Kaaba and the soldiers are crying and they're saying, how could we be burning this house when yesterday the Prophet purified it? You know what Hasin said to him? He said, if God didn't want us to do it, we wouldn't be able to do it, so do it. It's amazing. When you examine history and you see how history has taken its positions, um, Salawat ala Muhammad wa If you can remove this echo, please. Thank you. I, inshallah, within a few minutes after I'm done with this point. Thank you, may Allah bless you. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. I need to touch on this very quickly and then I will go to Karbala inshallah because this is all about Karbala. You find that these people took charge by pretending that God decreed it. You and I many a times when we want to do something or something is bad in our lives, we feel it's out of our control, there's nothing we can do, God wants it this way, so let me just submit to my evils. Wrong. Who anfusakum? Save yourselves. Do not allow Shaitan to whisper into your ears that it is not in your control, it is God who is doing this, so it's okay if you do something wrong, or if you are drinking alcohol, doing bad things, it's okay, God wants you to be this way. Allah never wants a human being to be in a state of uh, treachery, never, ever. Allah is too merciful, Allah is too merciful. Please don't say that. I'm gonna give you one quick proof on this, because I think it's important. <coughs> Definition of evil, this is the big question. Introduction. Definition of evil is the willful rejection of good. You must have the free will to reject good for evil to exist. Otherwise, evil doesn't exist. An explosion, earthquakes, when you have volcanoes, none of these are evil. When we have tsunamis, they're not evil. They're physical realities. And Allah has endowed animals. You know they say when Indonesia got the tsunami, the elephants were tied. They broke their chains and they ran up the mountains. Way before the tsunami came. Allah has already trained the animals to know that a tsunami is coming, go the other way. Camels in the desert can sense storms miles away. And they will stop and they will change direction. And a good camel rider will never redirect the camel. If the camel moves away, the camel rider knows there's something dangerous coming forward. Allah has endowed us to keep away from wrong things. So there's no evil in that. Evil is when you know there is something good. A good person is sitting next to you and you decide to cheat them. You decide to lie to them or you decide to harm them. This is evil. Now I want to ask you a simple question. We all agree and I can prove it without any doubt that Allah is all good. 100% all good. For there is not an iota of evil in God. And if God predestined us to do everything and, they, and we have no control of ourselves, and if God is controlling everything including Karbala, then don't we agree there is no such thing as evil in Karbala? For God does everything good. So how does that make sense when we know that there is evil? And Allah says, min sharri ma khalaq. Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq. Min sharri ma khalaq. I swear by the Lord of the dawn and by the evil which He created. Here God is saying the potential for you, intelligent, free will human beings, to reject me, 
I have allowed you, like a teacher, when the teacher gives you an exam, they have, the teacher has allowed you to fail, for the teacher can force you to pass. Don't forget that. A teacher allows you to fail, and that's proof that you have free will. For if a teacher forces me to pass, or a teacher forces me to fail, then neither is good. Please understand that. So Allah says, Min sharri ma halaq. By the shar that I have allowed you to reject me. Evil exists only under that parameter. Please understand that? So therefore, evil does exist. And since evil does exist, then it is definitely not the hand of Allah in all the negatives. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Long-term vision, and here are the verses. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this verse that I started in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says, وَبِالْآخِرَةِ هُمْ يُقِنُونَ First of all, Allah says, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Right? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they maintain prayers. وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ They give charity with what we give them. And they believe in the scriptures that were revealed before. And they have certainty in the day of judgment. Honestly, with all due respect, you will find nothing is more valuable and powerful than the knowledge of the unseen. When you and I hire pundits who come to our businesses and they guide us through complicated matters in business, who are the ones who get paid the most? The ones who can predict the future. The ones who understand the dynamics of society and the ones who will tell you to invest in the right position, knowing what are the chances that tomorrow will be the way it is so that you can benefit from that decision. So you will notice the most valuable commodity we own is the unknown. If you could know what will happen just tomorrow, okay, you would be the richest person in the world because you would position yourself today for everything for tomorrow and you would gain it with so much power that even the world will follow you. Because if you could tell them what will happen tomorrow with clarity, the world will bow to you. For there is nothing more powerful than the ilm al -ghayn. Knowledge of the unseen. So Allah is saying, who knows the unseen? The one who understands the present, who understands the wisdom God has given them, who understands what God gave before, and understands the history of prophets, and understands the, prob the problems of life today, and they can predict tomorrow. You and I, especially my young brothers and sisters, for example, we were temperamental when we were young. When I was younger, you know, I was very opinionated. This is the way it should be. Later on in life, you find out it doesn't work. Better just to be quiet. Just be patient. Let things mellow down and it'll pass. It's a passing cloud. Suddenly, by thinking carefully, you're exercising patience. Why? Because you've projected that yesterday I tried it, it didn't work. Why should I try it again? It doesn't work. That's why you'll notice older people tend to be calmer than younger people. Both are good, by the way. Young people having high energy is needed, and the old people who block you as conservatives is needed. That's what brings balance in society. So Allah is saying, who is the ultimate? You find all the verses in the Quran where Allah praises people who He honors the most, they say the following. Examine. I'm going to quote just a few of them and you will see what the Quran is talking about. Long-term vision. For example, Allah says, Yufuna bin Nadr. Fatima the Zahra, salamullahi alayha, as you know, she kept another. Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein were not feeling well. This is in Surah Al-Dahr. Surah Insan, you find that Allah is now you know, exemplifying this incredible family in houses whose the name of Allah is mentioned through them. Fatima the Zahra kept another. Allah says, Yufuna bin Nadri, They are afraid of that day. Meaning, Ahl Bayt and Prophets have taken into account that the mercy of God is so good, is so great, shame on us if we don't do good. And we have no strings attached. In other words, when we do good, we want nothing back from you. Why? Because we have been given too much credit from God. And the only thing we can do is love you, care for you, forgi you know, forgive you, and keep feeding you, and taking care of you. SubhanAllah. Examine. Amazing. يُفُونَ بِالنَّذْرِ وَيَخَافُونَ يَوْمًا كَانَ شَرُّهُ مُسْتَطِيرًا وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَى حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا What do they say? 
They feed the poor, the, the, the orphan, the wayfarer. But what do they do? They say, لا نريد منكم جزاء ولا شكورا. Look at the exam example of people with long-term vision. Look at their behavior. They are seeing Yom Al-Qiyamah like now. They are, they are seeing themselves being held accountable right now. Many of us forget this. That's why we cheat. That's why we do bad things. That's why we harm each other. We forgot the Day of Judgment. Allah is saying, if you, don't, if you don't forget the Day of Judgment constantly, every day, know that you are under watch and you're going to be held liable for everything you do, our behavior will change. Long-term vision. So Allah says, who are they? They say, لا نريد منكم جزاء ولا شكورا إنا نخاف من ربنا يوما عبوسا قمطريرا Notice how they say, we are afraid of that day when everybody will be held accountable, hearts will be palpitating. Shame on us if we do good with strings attached. Shame on us if we have harmful thoughts. Shame on us if we don't keep our promises. Hmm? Allah says, the rijalun. In Surah Nur, Rijalun, La tulhihim tijaratun wa la bay'an an dhikrillah. Every person I will talk about in Karbala, even tonight about Habib ibn Marahir, and Nafi bin Hilal, when I talk about him just now shortly, you will find these are the people. Rijalun, of course this is the prophets and the imams, Imam Ali alayhi salam, Rijalun, La tulhihim tijaratun wa la bay'an an dhikrillah. They don't bargain for anything to serve Allah. In other words, they are not for sale. لا تلهيهم تجارة ولا بيع. Imam Hussein alayhi salam. لا بيع except for Allah. عن ذكر الله وإقام الصلاة وإيتاء الزكاة. They are told their prayers. They give charity. يخافون يوما. See. And they are afraid of that day. تَتَقَلَّبُ فِي الْقُلُوبُ وَالْأَلْصَابِ See, they are afraid. Why? Because they have a vision. So when you find Habib, when you find all the companions, they are in Karbala, you're going to be butchered. They said, we see the Prophet. We see that right there, he's waiting for us. We're going to die like this. And what an honor. And we see it. We have been created for that purpose. This is why we exist on this earth. My brothers and sisters, if you and I want to get close to Allah, spend time meditating about the purpose of life. Spend time understanding the way Allah works. Spend time understanding why evil exists. Spend time understanding why Rahmah exists. And understand when we have trials and tribulations, it's not bad for us. It's good for us. Let's just not do it to ourselves. So two personalities. Tonight, you find Nafi'i, and uh, Hilal was a Yemeni from the Bajala tribe. He was a youth, but he loved Imam Hussein so much. Had such clarity of vision. This is about clarity of vision. When you ask, when we talk about running an education school, doing charity, traveling the world to go feed the orphan, you say, why? Why are you busy doing philanthropy, feeding the poor? Why don't you build a nest egg for yourself and build palaces and buy your own private jet? He says, then what? The human mind, the human body has been designed to be the happiest when it's in the giving mode. When you and I give, we're the happiest. And these youth that went to Karbala knew that there was no greater giving than the giving of their lives for Allah. They knew it. You and I as observers wonder, how did you do this? We need to talk about them so we become strong. That in the world today, when shaitan offers us something, we say, you know what, with all due respect, no. I have the best role models. They were offered money, Yazid offered them money, they offered them governorship, they offered them a lot of things, and they refused. And they were not willing to sell their souls to the devil. This is the conversation we're talking about. So now he calls, he was lying on the side, and he had arrows. And every arrow he dipped in poison. And he loved it. He said, I am dipping this arrow in poison because I am going to strike that shaitan on the other side, the one who wants to harm my imam. Look at this intrepid nature. This boy was from Yemen. You know, Imam Ali alayhi salam traveled to Yemen on the, on the 10th of, the, of, uh, 10th of uh, Hijrah. You find that the Prophet sent the last detachment. The Prophet's last detachment was Imam Ali alayhi salam who went to Yemen. When he went to Yemen and he brought the Hamdan tribes to Islam, you know, 
Khalid bin Walid went before, two years ago, before that, six months he spent there, not a single person became a believer. Imam Ali alayhi salam goes, they fall in love with him. And the entire tribe becomes Muslim. And their love for Ahl al-Bayt is exemplary today. And you will find Abu Dhar al-Ghafari was the one who went to the southern part of Lebanon, Jabal Am. You find his spirit is what's bringing resistance in that part of the world. Imam Rada was sent to Mashhad and his spirit is standing there. You find wherever these agents of God go, they become pegs, sin singular pegs that become so powerful that the superpowers of the world today with all the wealth and arms cannot touch them. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al-Muhammad. find that Imam Ali alayhi salam going to Yemen, what an honor. And these people of Yemen. So this one boy who was in the army of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he says, I am poisoning every arrow so I will strike them. And he said he puts it in his arrow and starts to pull the bow. And he strikes and he kills a dozen of Yazid's army. Twelve of them, he strikes them one by one. Then he runs out of arrows, he takes his sword. He says, now watch me, you know. My name is Naf'i bin Hilal. Watch how I fight. And they attacked him. He's a youth. But that valor, Rijalun, la tulhihim tijaratun wala bay'un. Put them, put this person in our heart. Not just a name. Say, I want to be like Naf'i. I want to be like Habib ibn Allah. So every day, my life is for you, O Allah. For I see the day of judgment too. Nafi says, I can't wait. And I am so honored to defend this Imam that God has commanded me to obey. Atiullah wa atiul Rasul wa ulilamri minkum. He goes fighting. And finally he is struck and both his arms are cut off. Both. He's bleeding. His beard is bleeding profusely. And he's full of valor and smiling. Shimmer captures him by his neck. This boy has no arms left. When I read these stories, this boy is telling me, Hassanin, see me? How blessed I am to get shahada. And notice I have no fear. Not only did I attack them, but even when they took my arms off, I didn't lose hope. So Shimmer brings him to Ibn Sa'd. And now he is now on the floor. And Ibn Sa'd said, what did you do? He said, I killed 12 of yours. And if I had my arms, you wouldn't have captured me. Look at the valor. Unafraid. He's already in the enemy's side. He knows he's going to get killed. He doesn't care. He's looking. He says, I don't care. So Shimr says to Umar Ibn Sa'd, kill him. <laughs> Umar says, well, you brought him. You know, Shimr was a devil incarnate. Shimr of the Allahu Akbar. This man was spineless. So you find that Shemal is holding him. He's about to kill him. And Nafi looks at him and says, if you were a Muslim, you wouldn't do this to the grandson of the Prophet, nor to his follower like me. But you are not a Muslim. And you know what? I am so honored to become Shaheed at the hands of the most treacherous creation on earth. Do it. This is what he tells him. He says, you are such a mal'oon that I am happy to get shahada through your hands. You know what? That sentence must have reverberated into the head of Shimmer for the rest of his life. For if a young boy can be so strong, armless, who's being held, and he's looking at Shimmer and says, go ahead and do this and remove me from this world for I see the Prophet awaiting me. Subhanallah. This is the kind of quality we're talking about. Habib ibn Madahir, who was similar in age to Imam Hussein, from young age he loved Imam Hussein. When Habib used to hear the name of Imam Hussein, even as a child, he would come running outside of his house just to come and see Imam Hussein. Habib was from Kufa, Habib was from the Banu Asad tribe, and Habib's love was intense for Ahlul Bayt. In fact, Habib ibn Madahir was one of the most revered personalities in Kufa. 
He was so recognized, everybody knew of his valor, his strength, his iman, and his incredible submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Habib ibn Madahir is in Kufa. He is one of the ones who wrote the letter to Imam Hussein, but he was trapped. Suddenly, he gets a letter from Imam Hussein. Now, I want you to understand, Habib also had a boy. His name was Qasim. He was a teenager. Qasim was in Kufa. Habib is reading this letter, and his wife is sitting on the dining table. Historians say that Habib had gone shopping that day for what we call henna. As you know, when your beard turns white, the Prophet had advised for looking young, make it dark during the time of the early days of Medina so that they differentiate themselves from the rest of the community. And it also brings shujaat, meaning strength. So Habib had bought Hina and he had kept it. He was going to color his beard. He opens up the letter and Imam Hussain alayhi salam says, I am in Karbala, I have been trapped. Habib, come to me. Because Habib was special. Historians say Habib was so special. The love Imam Hussain alayhi salam had for Habib was second to none among all the companions. He was very close to Habib. Habib looks at this letter, he closes it, takes the henna, and he throws it. So he said, what good is this henna to color my beard when this beard should be colored with blood? So Habib seeks permission. His wife says, go, my, my, my beloved, go. Hussein calls you, go. What a woman. What a woman who says to her husband, go. Hussein ibn Ali is calling you, go. So Habib says to his servant, he says, take my horse and hide it in the farm so that I can escape sideways because Ibn Ziyad is monitoring me. Habib had this insatiable desire. He says, I want to go to Karbala. I want to become Shaheed because they have this desire. They have this intense desire to become Shaheed. So Habib escapes and he runs and his servant who was waiting for him noticed that Habib was slightly delayed. Historians say that that servant mentioned that if Habib doesn't come on time, I will get on the horse and I will go fight for Hussein. When Habib comes to his servant, he says to him, thank you for holding my horse, you can leave, I free you, go. The servant says, never, never. You will get martyrdom, I want martyrdom. Can I join you? You know when I read this sentence, something came in my mind. A servant of a great personality who was not a servant, he was a sage. You know when you have a servant and your servant can have such thoughts with Iman, you are not an ordinary master. You are an extraordinary master. Like Fatima al-Zahra alayha, had Fidda. Fidda was her servant. You know, Fidda was a servant of Fatima alayhi salam, but Fidda for 20 years spoke nothing but the Quran. Nothing but the Quran. How did she know that? She was with the best teacher possible. Uh, Habib ibn Madahir was like that. I want us to know this. So Habib says, then join me. He gets on the horse with him and they trot to Karbala. Historians say when Habib arrives, Imam embraces him like his own brother. He holds him, says, Habib, I am so happy you have joined me. Habib says, I am for you. You are my master and I am honored to be with you. Habib ibn Madahir was, as you know, fighting on the right flank. He actually held the flank for almost the entire day. Habib was so intrepid they say, historians say he killed over 62 people. 62 enemies by his own hand, he killed them. It's not easy to kill 62. And Habib is looking at the enemy and says the following. He said, if we were even half in size of your army, you are 30,000, we are only 100, less than 100. If we were half of your size, we would have annihilated you. For that is how much love we have for Allah and you wouldn't be able to touch us. But today is your day. And Habib fights, and he fights, and he strikes. They say he hit Hasim bin Tamim, he hit him on the head, 
literally cut his head, Hasim falls, but Hasim survives. But while Habib is fighting, they ganged on him and they struck him. And they struck him so badly on his head. They pierced the lance into his back, into his chest. They completely were on top of him. Now, Habib was such a great figure that they knew if they took his head, they would get the most money. Imam notices that Habib has been hit, Habib has fallen, Habib is about to die. And Imam is standing, they say he leaned forward and he cried. He said, they are breaking my back, for this Habib is of me. But they ganged on him, and he was the first soldier whose head was separated from his body. And the horseman took the head and refused to put it anywhere, but hung it on the side of the horse and started trotting around the head with his army to show off, look who I killed. This was Habib. Historians say that after Karbala, you know, that head was taken to Kufa. And this man who beheaded him is carrying the head, going into the palace of Kufa to give to Ibn Ziyad to show him my treasure. Look what I did, Habib. He was so pious, he was so prayerful. Noor was coming out of his face. So as he's entering the palace of Kufa, his son Qasim notices that's his father. <laughs> if there's one sad moment, it's when you see your father's head separated from his body. <laughs> this is a teenage boy who looks at his father and he says, that's my father's head. My father has become what? This young boy comes and approaches this man and says, who are you? He says, I am holding the head of somebody very precious and I've come to demand money for it. He says, can you give it to me? He says, who are you? He says, that's my father. I want to bury him. He says, I can't let you have it. I will never let you have it. I'm gonna take this head and go take my money. This young boy Qasim looks at him and says, shame on you for what you have done. How dare you kill the greatest man in Kufa? You killed my father and you have no shame. What kind of a human being are you? Qasim did not forget. Historians say Qasim grew older. In his 20s, he joined an army. And when he joined an army, he was focused on that same killer until finally he sees him in one of the battles that took place with the son of, as we say, Abdullah. And you find that he fights. And there he notices the same man who took the head of his father. And he finally strikes him and he kills him. اللهم إنا نرغب إليك في دولة كريمة تعز بها الإسلام وأهله وتظل بها النفاق وأهله وتجعلنا فيها من الدعاة لا تعدك والقادة لا سبيلك وترزقنا بها كرامة الدنيا والآخرة ربنا اغفر لنا ولإخواننا الذين سبقونا بالإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا رب إنك رؤوف الرحيم رسل five times أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما
اللهم كل وليك حجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى Oh, 
Amen. Mm-hmm.